about 50 years of pulsars, and uh, several of us were there. And I actually showed this slide, because, and I think it's relevant here, and it connects to what uh, Norbert was talking about earlier. Uh, so basically, the discovery of pulsars, you can extend back to 1951 or so. The, anyway, the, the shortly after World War II, uh, when ionospheric scintillations were recognized, and Tony Hewish was a big player. I don't know if you can see these names across here, but this is a partial attribution. And anyway, so Tony Hewish was involved with that. He looked at solar corona scintillations and then uh, basically established that interplanetary scintillations were happening. He built his array that led to pulsars. Uh, another uh, uh, channel for resolution was using lunar occultations on quasars and then inventing interferometry to study quasars at high resolution. So in 1967, pulsars were discovered. Um, VLBI was basically invented, uh, certainly by that time, if not in 1965. And then since then, um, the rest is history, as they say. So there's been uh, a lot of understanding, as you heard today, about diffractive interstellar scintillations, um, interstellar turbulence, lensing, refractive scintillations, and so forth. Uh, and now we're in the FRB era, at least in part. And I think some of the same issues that were talked about in the early days of pulsars, are, the same questions are being asked today about FRB. So I think that's kind of a, you know, it's an eternal recurrence type thing. One of the people that, um, so uh, I think Norbert mentioned Scheuer, Rickett, Lyon, and Saltpeter. I want to mention Lovelace. Uh, Norbert also mentioned him uh, because uh, Richard's uh, PhD thesis actually was highly influential on, on my work. Uh, so anyway, I'll get to that. So the basic picture, another basic picture you can have is um, something like this. This is what we're talking about in the simplest case, I would say, is a thin phase screen. Um, let's say with a Kolmogorov phase uh, pattern here. Downstream of, of that screen, you get a diffraction pattern. Here I'm showing it in 3D, X, Y, and frequency. So this is actually the result of a Kirchhoff diffraction integral um, calculation. And so these black splotches here are the scintils in space and in frequency. Uh, we, we move through this pattern and make measurements of different frequencies and that gives us a, gives us a dynamic spectrum. Uh, the other thing that can happen though is you may have a screen or uh, this one or an additional one that strongly refracts the radiation and that can bend this cone uh, back and forth or maybe give you multiple images. I think there's a lot of evidence for multiple images and I'll show you a couple of things. <clears throat> but one of the issues here, I think one of the issues for this week is um, using scintillations and lensing and so forth to resolve sources. I mean, that goes back to the Hewish IPS um, uh, implementation that discovered pulsars. He was basically using IPS as a filter on the sky to find quasars. Uh, okay, and then Jocelyn Bell, uh, of course, took advantage of that uh, serendipitously. So uh, quenching of uh, DISS, diffractive scintillations, goes like this. You have, let's say you have an extended source here. Um, if it were a point source, you would see scintillations, as I showed you before, with some scattering angle or diffraction angle theta d, and projected back to the screen, which, which is here, that would have a length scale L sub d. So if you have an extended source, the, co uh, the coherence length of, that, um, of its radiation goes like lambda over it, the source size. You need that coherence length to be bigger than L sub d. If it's smaller, you, you quench the scintillations. So the requirement here then is that you need the, uh, the coherence length of the radiation from the source to be bigger than the diffraction length, and that gives you an upper limit on the angular size, which is lambda over the distance from the observer to the lens or screen, and then uh, the diffraction angle. Um, and this ends up being about a micro arc second or less. Okay, so now to uh, Richard's thesis. Um, you can find this on the web. I actually have a copy. It's, you know, it's very thick. Uh, as I say, it's 400 pages, 400 equations, all hand-drawn. So this is back in the pre-LaTeX days. <laughs> so uh, if you complain about LaTeX, uh, it could have been worse. 
So anyway, his thesis was primarily about IPS and power laws versus Gaussian density spectra. So people were arguing about whether the interplanetary medium had Gaussian-like blobs or versus a power law. Uh, some of that same argument uh, spilled over to the interstellar scattering situation. But anyway, this was 1970. So here's, uh, so the thing I really want to point out here is uh, buried in Appendix I on page three, pages 390 and 391, he's got uh, this section called Size of Pulsar Emitting Region where he bas basically does the same calculation that I showed you. He uh, has the theta, theta critical here. It's 0.2 micro arc seconds in this case. And then he estimates the size of a pulsar magnetosphere and it's comparable. So he basically laid out the case. And so anyway, when I, um, I guess it was more than 10 years later, uh, when I arrived at Cornell, I got a copy of Dick's thesis and read this part. And so that influenced um, th that, those pages plus other things in his thesis really uh, had an effect on what I did. So anyway, you can use um, scintillations of various types to resolve pulsars. Um, uh, and it looks like uh, people have to some extent. But anyway, there are different methods you can take. One is you can, what you expect uh, if you have strong scattering and saturated diffractive scintillations. Saturated simply means that the field fluctuations are Gaussian, complex Gaussian, and so the amplitude distribution, the intensity distribution is exponential. And you have 100% intensity modulations. If you have two sources, point sources that are offset, they will both produce 100% modulations, but the, their diffraction patterns will be shifted spatially from each other, and in frequency for that matter. Uh, if you have more widely separated point sources, that is uh, wider uh, spacing than theta critical, then the, the diffractive scintillations will be uncorrelated. So if you have a source, uh, a source, an extended source made up of a whole bunch of point sources, it's pretty clear um, that, that you can wash out the scintillations. So what you can do is you can look for, um, you know, less than 100% modulation for a source. Um, you can look at pulse components that have identical dynamic spectra, but shifted slightly. You can look for a correlation coefficient between the dynamic spectra that's less than one. That is the dynamic spectra between components. Or you can look at uh, how the scintillation arcs might uh, behave uh, when you have a, uh, an extended source. Um, so anyway, uh, so with IPS, uh, interplanetary scintillation, the resolution is about an arc second. As I've said, uh, for ISS, it's about a micro arc second. So anyway, there were some, um, you know, a couple examples. Uh, Norbert mentioned our 1983 work. Uh, I'm going to show you this work that Alex Wolshan and I did in 87 and a couple of other things. Um, so here's a cartoon for why you might expect um, to see, you know, in the simplest case, the simplest pulsar model why you might expect to see different scintillations from different pulse components. So here's a cartoon of a pulse with two, uh, two components. Um, we're pretty sure, I would say, that uh, the emission from those components comes from opposite sides of the magnetic pole of a rotating neutron star. And because those lines are, uh, the field lines are curved, that means that when component one is emitting tor toward you from here, Component two, when it beams toward this, is going to be over here. And that separation end, uh, ends up depending on the altitude of emission. Um, anyway, that's the basic cartoon. So this, was, uh, this is actually in a, a chapter of Ryan Shannon's thesis. And uh, he got his PhD in 2010, if I'm remembering correctly. And this chapter is still not yet published. <laughs> but uh, that's why I say it's in preparation. But I've been bugging him. Uh, and so I think it's going to be up to me to submit the paper. Okay, so um, anyway, Alex Wolshan and I made, were making measurements of dynamic spectra in the 80s. And he, um, you know, and he was at the observatory. I was in New York. Um, and he, uh, I think it was at the IRSI meeting in January of 1987, he showed me uh, these results. Because we'd been monitoring this pulsar. And all of a sudden, it started showing this dramatic fringing pattern in, in the dynamic spectra. So that's December 9th of 86. Um, 
let's see, you know, 10, 10 or so days later, the same fringe pattern, but with a spacing change. By post-Christmas, uh, those fringes had gone away for the most part. And prior to December 9th, uh, it looked more like this amorphous type thing. If you look at the secondary spectra uh, or the power spectra, we really were focused on these islands because it looked to us like we were just seeing the effects of two images, sub-images, that were then interfering with each other. This, it's just like a two-element interferometer. Um, so we didn't really, we weren't looking to study the ISM. We wanted to uh, exploit it to try to resolve the magnetosphere. So anyway, you can see these islands of, of power here. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, some splitting here. And then uh, just a simple um, power spectrum here for this amorphous scintillation. Okay, so what we did was we looked at the dynamic spectra. We looked at that fringe pattern um, between uh, and how it varied between different components, uh, the pulse components. So we, here was our pulse profile. It looks pretty crummy, uh, but back in those days with data rates and such, we couldn't um, get high resolution on the on the pulse and get a dynamic spectrum. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this is what we have. So we could measure the phase of that fringe pattern <clears throat> as a function of, uh, of pulse longitude, it says here. Typically, we, these days, we call it pulse phase. And anyway, we saw this systematic change across the pulse. And anyway, to make a long story short, it seemed to indicate that the altitude of emission was quite high relative to the light cylinder. Uh, there were similar results by Smirnova, Shishov, Malofiev uh, on other pulsars as well. Uh, so anyway, the, the nominal uh, interpretation again was a high altitude, but if you put, if you had a special case like put the lensing screen near the pulsar, you could change, change the answer. Uh, so I was always kind of perplexed by this, and it was like, uh, okay, what the heck? This is what it is. Um, and I, you know, in retrospect, and actually from more recent thinking, I kind of favor the lensing screen near the pulsar, but that's just a, a hunch. Okay, so uh, let me talk about scintillation arcs. So Barney and Dan uh, talked um, quite nicely about arcs, and, and Barney basically showed a similar thing like this, where you have a, a scattered image, and the green here represents, let's say, the 1 over E contour of the image. And theta one and theta two are just uh, two two arbitrary points on that image, so those two points will map to the secondary spectrum along an arc, a forward arc, uh, like let's say for example here. So, <clears throat> so anyway, the we have the conjugate frequency here that would is called a delay, and it's typically a microsecond, and we have a fringe rate or Doppler um, a Doppler. Um, shift uh, that is typically a, a millihertz. So the expressions are here. The, um, uh, the delay goes like uh, theta squared, theta two squared minus theta one squared. Uh, the, the other quantity here goes like the dot product of the velocity with the angular difference. So that's what you've got. So the question is, how long are these arcs in, in this um, conjugate domain, in the spectral domain? So let's see. Um, yeah, okay, here it is. So uh, if the image size is, you know, if the core of the image is theta sub e, uh, what Dan told you, and uh, what Dan told you was that the, the image, the scattered images have long wings. And it's because of those wings that we see the, the parabolic features in the secondary spectrum. So I'm basically saying here that um, the image goes out, the image wings go out some multiple m times the one over e radius. So the, the maximum uh, fringe rate that you would expect is gonna be m times uh, the core angular size times the velocity divided by wavelength. S here is the fractional distance from the source uh, to the screen. Okay, so basically what that means, it's not a cutoff per se, but it's a roll-off. It's a characteristic length for the arc. So now if you have a finite source size, <clears throat> then um, I don't know if you can see it from the back, but uh, there is a, um, an upper bound on, on the arc length here from the finite source size. It basically goes like one over distance times the size of the source. 
So if you had a really extended source, you get rid of the arcs, and, and you would also get rid of all of the scintillation. Okay, so um, anyway, in the paper that, in the chapter of Ryan Shannon's thesis that, uh, that I mentioned, um, we were using the beautiful data from Briskin et al. Uh, to, and we're looking at the data differentially with pulse phase. So we are comparing different pulse phases. Uh, the, so here's the dynamic spectrum, um, and here's the secondary spectrum that you've seen before. So we were looking for, uh, you know, a, a, corollary, a corollary of what I just said on the previous slide is that the further out on the arc you are, the more resolving power you have on the source sides. Okay, so we were looking for changes of, let's say, this island here as a function of pulse phase. We didn't see any. We didn't see any change at all. Um, however, we did do things like um, we looked at the correlation, uh, the cross correlation of the dynamic spectra between different pulse phase components. So let me just uh, walk you through this. So here's our pulse shape again. Uh, not, the, not the best um, pulse phase resolution, but we basically have uh, 15 or 16 phase bins. And then we take the dynamic spectrum for pairs of phase bins and cross correlate. So here's two adjacent phase bins, seven and eight. They're auto correlation functions. Um, this is versus time lag and the cross correlation function. The correlation coefficient is pretty much hovering around unity. So those two phase components, pulse phase components are highly correlated. If we correlate uh, number seven with number 13, then we see a reduced correlation. Um, not by a lot, it's maybe a few percent, but, but it seems to be significant. So here again is the pulse shape. Um, and now this is showing the correlation coefficient between number seven and all other phase bins. And you see the systematic drop. Um, if you correlate, if you use number 13 as the phase reference, then you see a rise as you go towards it. So we're, you know, we think this is reasonably good, but we've kind of agonized over instrumental effects and, and so forth, polarization effects. And that's one of the reasons why Ryan has been um, reticent, let's say, in publishing this. Okay, and then uh, what Ryan did was, I'm not going to explain this at all, but he turned these results into constraints on uh, the image, well, the, the scattering disk shape and also the, the sizes of, of the emission regions relative to the uh, direction of pulsar motion. There's no way I can explain this, um, but it's, it's there. Okay, so let's move on to two screen cases because the gist of... Um, a number of situations is that you can have, let's say, the first screen that radiation encounters scatter the radiation and quench the scintillations that would be produced by a second uh, screen, or at least somehow influence them. So anyway, the, I'm going to use as my uh, case here FRBs. So here we have an FRB source in a host galaxy. Um, the bursts propagate through the intergalactic medium as well as the host galaxy and then enter the the Milky Way, where we know that if it looks like a point source by the time the radiation gets to the Milky Way, it's going to scintillate. Um, anyway, so there's a, this is just a setup, but now I'll show another example from Richard's thesis, uh, where he basically analyzed this in great gory detail. Not FRBs, but the two screen case of the interplanetary medium, the ISM. So he pointed out, and this is well known now, that uh, when you have two screens, the modulate, the f this is the modulation index of the intensity. Uh, so basically sigma i over mean intensity. Uh, and you get the individual terms from the two screens, but then you get a cross term. So there's some kind of nonlinear interaction. So in the, if you look at power spectra of scintillations, you get, let's say, a, a low frequency ISS feature here, you get an IPS feature, and then you have a combined feature. And if, uh, so PNM relates to the source size, and so you can quench the ISS but keep the IPS and vice versa. Uh, so anyway, back in the 70s, Barney was involved with this um, uh, and others, uh, the interstellar scattering suppresses the interplanetary scintillations of the crab pulsar at low frequencies when the crab gets very near the sun. So it's that finite source effect, uh, the finite source 
produced by ISS that causes that. Uh, anyway, it's exactly the same situation can happen with FRBs. Okay, so, um, so this is what I've been spending my time on, not so much resolving pulsar magnetospheres, but looking at FRBs. So here is a depiction of what the isoplanetic angle is. That's the critical angular size. <clears throat> so this is in micro arc seconds, plotted against galactic latitude and longitude. Um, this is for one gigahertz. And keep in mind, this is integrating all the way through the galaxy. So integrating the NE2001 model. Uh, so at low latitudes, uh, the, well, the critical angular size gets to be sort of a hundredth of a micro arc second. It's very tiny. And at high latitudes, it's more like uh, the numbers I was quoting before, a few tenths of, of a micro arc second. So what that means is that any finite si you know, finiteness of the FRB source size is, can very much quench the scintillations at low latitudes compared to high latitudes. There are other effects as well. The scintillation bandwidth, the correlation bandwidth, um, also declines dramatically as you go to low latitudes. So those two effects together, um, let's see, I guess I want to go to this slide. First, those two effects together may account for what uh, seems to be the case. I don't think this is ironclad, but it seems to be the case that FRBs are easier to detect at high latitudes than low latitudes. It's small number of statistics, um, but anyway, this is not the data. <laughs> this is the number of FRB detections in a simulation that I ran, where I included um, bandwidth quenching of scintillations, but I did not include source size suppression that I was talking about. Um, but the two of them together, well, if I included source size suppression, it would be even worse if I adopted some reasonable source size for the FRB. Um, Okay, so now um, the other aspect of FRBs, that at least it's the FRB situation that has led uh, some of the work on this is plasma lensing. Um, and I think one of a very nice paper in the literature is Clegg et al, 1998, where they talk about the Gaussian lens. Um, that's an unrealistic kind of lens, I would say, but nonetheless, it illustrates a lot of generic features that I think are important. Basically, you see caustics uh, really uh, strong brightenings if you're far enough away from the lens, and that can dramatically boost the, the signal strength of an FRB. Uh, and we think we're seeing the effects of that kind of thing with the repeating FRB. So uh, there's a precedent for this as well. There's a, a nice paper by Graham Smith et al. on lensing from filaments in the Crab Nebula. So here's uh, uh, during a range of epochs. Um, this is also Don Backer's work. Um, for a range of epochs, you could see uh, you could see double. You would see the the crab's pulse uh, in a double way. So you can't read it here, but this is pulse phase, and this is epoch along the y-axis. So anyway, lensing seem to be coming from filaments, the well-known filaments that are in the crab nebula, uh, which can provide actually pretty high, uh, very high el electron densities. So sim similar features may pertain to FRBs. Okay, so uh, we've been looking at, um, at lensing, and uh, this is showing some of the key points. Again, for a Gaussian lens, uh, the x-axis here is the observer's plane. Uh, here's the lens plane. I have a downwards going Gaussian here because the phase is negative, the diverging lens. Um, and anyway, for some positions of the observer, you will see three images, other places one image. Same thing holds versus frequency. Um, there's some frequencies where you may see three images and others where you see one image. So all, of, at least for the Gaussian lens, it's all quite simple. It's, there's just a single parameter that involves the dispersion measure depth of the lens, the wavelength, and the size of the lens squared, plus some, you know, the distance of the <coughs> lens from the source and the observer and so forth. It's really easy to get a gigaparsec focal distance um, from a, a very modest lens, like a dispersion measure depth of about 15 parsecs per centimeter cubed, a lens size of 100 AU, and then a distance of, of a gigaparsec. Um, so again, we think that's, uh, looks, we, we think we're seeing the effects of something like this. And here, here is some of the evidence for that. So this is showing on published bursts. <laughs> Um, 
analyzed by Daniele McKeeley, and uh, there's a paper by Jason Hessels that's in preparation. So this is showing individual births. Uh, so these are basically um, time frequency plots. So they, they are dynamic spectra. They've been de-dispersed with the same dispersion measure, okay, the same average dispersion measure. If we didn't de-disperse them, uh, these bursts would be, you know, the, I don't, I'm guessing, but the slope would probably extend, you know, across the width of this room at least. So the, the changes in slope that you can see here are um, deviations from that you know, that average dispersion sweep. And we're not quite sure how to interpret this, um, but, you know, because you could say, well, we have the dispersion measure wrong, or it's varying on time scales of minutes somehow. Uh, instead, we think uh, there's, you know, there are other features here that you can see, like this corrugation here in uh, many of the, the light curves that you see here. Uh, that are re very reminiscent of dynamic spectra of, pulsar, of galactic pulsars, like you've seen probably ad nauseum now. <laughs> uh, no, oh, okay, it can't be ad nauseum, okay. Uh, so that suggests that there's an interference effect, and that's exactly what you could get if you have uh, multiple images that are arriving. Um, the other thing that, uh, that we looked at in this paper that came out earlier this year was the arrival time differences of these three images that you might see. And those are, it depends on the lens parameters, but the arrival times can be long enough so that you see three different bursts, they're not overlapping at all. Um, in fact, the separations could be seconds if you wanted to arrange it. Um, on the other hand, you can have with realistic lenses, they may land within a microsecond or less of each other, in which case they will interfere and produce perhaps these kinds of structures. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, this is, uh, I would say, we're qualitatively convinced that this has something to it. We need to show quantitatively, um, and that's, that's what we're in the middle of doing. Okay, so here's an example of, uh, of a frequency time, a frequency position plane for the Gaussian lens. The main feature is you see caustics, these sharp things that depend on frequency uh, quite strongly, but there's also this central trough <clears throat> that uh, where the, the source becomes very dim. For the case of the repeating FRB, there will be some days when we will measure 15 bursts. There are other, we can go for a stretch of a month or longer and not see anything. Um, so anyway, these narrow caustics are, are, are short in duration and the trough is actually long in duration. Uh, so again, that, you know, it's circumstantial evidence, I would say. Uh, of course, we're not going to have Gaussian lenses. If you distort the lens slightly, then you can get much more intricate frequency time uh, caustics here. So, okay, so um, the same effects, uh, so I, I, besides an FRB hat, I'm also wearing a precision timing hat uh, with, uh, in, in the nanograph collaboration where we're trying to do the best possible timing um, to try to detect long wavelength gravitational waves. So if these kinds of things are happening not only for an FRB, we know that similar things do happen uh, from the interstellar medium in our galaxy. Uh, the Fiedler et al. extreme scattering events, um, some other pulsar events, and so forth. So anyway, uh, we're, uh, so I, this is a little extreme, uh, precision timing, 10 nanoseconds or bust. Uh, the best timing we have over sustained durations of years is about 30 nanoseconds. Um, but we would like to do better than that. So I have a statement here that if, the, if all we had to worry about was the dispersion delay, it would be easy to get 10 nanoseconds. The fact of the matter, though, is we've got all this fine structure in the interstellar medium that uh, scatters and refracts, and that causes the dispersion measure to be a function of frequency as well as time. You know, time because sources are moving, the geometry is changing, frequency because the ray paths are changing with frequency. So this is a nuisance, um, and we're trying to, to deal with it. So one of the pieces of evidence um, here is that, so all of the millisecond pulsars that we're monitoring show dispersion measure delay, uh, fluctuations, sort of at the 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 parsecs per cc level. 
Uh, and some of those are consistent with Kolmogorov fluctuations. Some of them are consistent with the pulsar moving away from us or towards us and just the path length getting longer or shorter. But we see events, this is a weird event, um, or a distinct event anyway, from J1713 plus 0747. Looks like a sharp drop and sort of an exponential-like rise here. Uh, that's with our more um, coarse, coarsely sampled data from a number of years ago. Um, but in the recent, in the last couple of years, there's another event that's much better sampled. And it looks pretty much the same. Sharp drop, exponential-like rise. So the thing we've demonstrated is that you can't explain this with just a change in dispersion measure. And it's, ba it's easy to argue that because we know the time scale here. We know what the velocity of the pulsar is. If you have a structure that's small enough to produce this, that is with, a, let's say, a, a cloud that's moving across the line of sight or some kind of structure, uh, if it's that small, it's also going to refract the radiation. And so as soon as you have refraction plus dispersion, um, the wavelength scaling can be different than lambda squared and, and all that stuff. So anyway, the second event's being written up in a paper by Michael Lamb et al. And we're looking at models for, uh, for this. I know Wei Li's thought about this as well uh, with respect to lensing and, and refraction. Okay, so I will, um, I, I take it that you're standing because I, yeah. I'm sure on time. Okay, so uh, I wanted to advertise that part of the analysis that, um, that we've been doing for FRBs is you have to look at the diffraction, you have to look at the scintillation statistics. Uh, and you, know, you have to model them. And so I spent um, a few months uh, uh, putting together some code. Well, first of all, the, the analytical work, but then the code that would give you the, uh, the, the probability density function for the intensity for a given radio frequency, bandwidth, and direction, galactic coordinates. Uh, this is, right now it's structured for FRB, so integrating to infinity again. But basically you can go to 20 gigahertz and be in the weak scattering regime, you get this distribution as compared to the dash line here, which is an exponential distribution, it's a log scale here. Uh, or you can go down to, um, let's say, a low frequency like 0.1 gigahertz. This is at low latitude, galactic latitude. Uh, so very strong scattering, and you've basically quenched most of the scintillation. So you get a very narrow PDF. So basically, it'll give you a PDF no matter what frequency you, you request and what direction you, you request. Um, it was a royal pain, as far as I'm concerned, to come up with this. But anyway, I have... A, I do, it's not public yet, but it's basically called Milky Way Scent.py uh, that is based on the NE2001 model. And I'm happy to make it available on an ad hoc basis, you know, near term, but uh, it, it will eventually make the light of day. So just a summary, you know, I think we're at the, really at the early stages of all this interesting work on scintillometry. And what I'm focusing on is precision timing, um, interstellar medium structure modeling, uh, FRB detection rates, and FRB source environments. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I think the ones that may look I'm not sure if the dips from the other ones are, you know, are they part of a process or are they due to distinct structures? Um, that's a question that I, I would ask. I guess there are the ESE type things that, that do look more symmetric. Well, you can get that with a symmetric lens, you know, like a, a Gaussian type lens. I think that the, the one-sidedness, you know, the strong asymmetry means that you have a sharp edge of a struck, a relatively sharp edge of a structure, and then slow decay. Sorry, a shocky thing. A shocky thing yeah. 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 I think he meant it figuratively, but yeah, but yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, what we see is the projected column density of of electrons.
not noticed at all until you hit the object. So there's a, um, um, yeah, I wonder if you can see it, it, it's got a different process of the line to all image viewing that you would think with a density profile. So there are, and I think, I think it's very interesting. Um, yeah. So I didn't point it out. I only, when I showed this slide, I only talked about these upper plots, uh, which involve a, a positive D, a DM enhancement from a, a cloud or something. So I also looked at a negative dispersion measure lens, which would be something like a gap in a dense screen. And you get, uh, you still get caustics, but they're quite different. Instead of getting a central trough, you get the trough is filled. And you can get a very strong focal point here. So I think the thing about, um, the J1713 uh, DM variations, wherever it is. Uh, anyway, I lost it. Uh, the thing is, it's it's only about a microsecond of time deep at one and a half gigahertz. And it does not seem to involve a big change in the intensity of, of the pulsar. Now, the caveat on that is, is that the diffractive scintillations have really fat Sintels, and so the intensity is going like this according to the ex exponential distribution. So if there was a more systematic rise because of lensing, we might not see it. But it, but we can put an upper bound on it. It's probably just two, a factor of two or three. So we have to whatever the the structure is, it doesn't seem to increase the intensity of the pulsar dramatically. <laughs> Sure. But not all caustics have to be produce big intensity gains. It depends on where you are in frequency and time. Of course, of course. Yeah, they right. Are, and of course they are, they are way off yeah, you can still have caustics, is all I'm saying. Well, I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying. In the overdense limit, you can have caustics, but it, they need not produce super high intensities well, relative to the mean. Yeah, it's all it's all, it's all wave optics. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I worry that it's all wires and mirrors, but. Uh, with me. Okay. Not with my no, no, this is, no, this is uh, oh, okay. for the video. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. The HP light connection works, all right? So I couldn't resist the cliche, adding a cliched um, uh, phrase at the, uh, at the end of the title, just... Uh, just this morning, um, because it's probably the only contribution that I have to make, given the, the sterling uh, uh, talks that we've had from, from, from Barney, from Jim, and from Dan, already on, uh, on pulsar scintillation arcs. And Barney has already spoken a little bit about uh, what happens when you add VLBI into the mix. So my small contribution is to, is to elucidate that point a little bit uh, more carefully. And, uh, and, and because we're at CETA, I'm not afraid to throw around a few extra equations. And uh, I'm afraid that's a, a, that's a preface to my talk this afternoon. Like I see I've been dobbed in for a talk on birefringence in the ISM, so I'll throw around a few more there. And it's all Whaley's fault because we're here at CETA. So, uh, so the question is, I, I can remember as a... As a a fairly young and impressionable guy. I was wandering the corridors in Socorro, then OAO, and I saw um, Carl Gwynn down in the basement there. Um, he was, uh, he was, his, uh, his brow was, uh, was laden with sweat. Uh, 
as he was uh, trying to interpret these uh, secondary spectra that he was getting, he was getting out of the, uh, the VLBA. And of course, uh, these, uh, the VLBA dishes don't have an awful lot of sensitivity compared to, say, Arecibo or Green Bank. And so, uh, as I say, there was a considerable amount of sweat coming off his brow. And, 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 I, uh, and as he was doing this, I thought, well, there, there, mu there must be some extra information that's hidden in all of these visibilities on, on pulsars. And, and I went away up to my desk and started working on it. And I, uh, I started chatting over coffee with, uh, with Walter Briskin, who was already thinking about doing these uh, VLBI observations. And it turned out he'd been talking with, with you, Dan, about uh, some of these observations. And Oh, was it was Barney as well? I think it I think it was with both of you. But anyway, he mentioned your name. I'm pretty sure. Um, but anyway, um, and, and so I, I started thinking about well, what happens when you destroy this uh, symmetry in the uh, secondary spectrum? So, so the secondary spectra that we've we've come to know and love look like this, and we've seen this already many times today. This uh, 0834 uh, dynamic spectrum turned into a secondary spectrum and of course here you only see the positive delays in the secondary spectrum and the question is well it, the point is that once you measure uh, the, uh, the visibility you're measuring a complex value quantity and so there's in principle extra information in those negative delays and the question was well what is there and so I started off using this uh, Walker-Riddell formalism to try and answer this, or played around with it, and and, and this uh, this sort of formalism starts from the uh, Spinel-Kirchhoff integral, and it says that the uh, that in the regime of strong scattering, so Barney's been talking about uh, about some of these scintillation arclets in the regime of relatively weak scintillations with a Born uh, modulation index of less than one. This sort of formalism applies only when you, we're really in the regime of strong scattering. So we're talking about things that, you know, these low frequencies, 300 megahertz pulsars in the galactic plane, that sort of a thing. Um, but in that particular case, the phase wraps very quickly. And so you can make this stationary phase approximation, which says that I can break this integral up into a whole bunch of phasors. So I have, I have uh, thing. This, so I can represent this integral as some sum of points which have a, both a phase and an amplitude. And the idea is that this phase here contains, this is the screen phase and this is this uh, geometric phase. And the point is that the stationary phase approximation says it's a condition on the, well, as it says, on the uh, phase derivative. Um, and, and so you get these contributions to this integral from these points of stationary phase. So you can rewrite this, uh, this wave field as these, this sum over these magnifications, which includes the second derivative of the, of the phase on the phase screen, and these phasors. And that's the stationary phase approximation, if, or the stationary phase condition, if you can see it down there. And you can use this, uh, this approximation then. You say, well, that's my wave field. I've just got a sum. And, and so you can say, well, what's the visibility then? And so I can just multiply this wave field that I measure at one point, R1, with the wave field that I measure at some other point, R2, on the observer's plane, and take the complex conjugate. And so it's, it's much easier to do this as a double sum than a double integral, of course. And so you, uh, you get this, uh, this sort of a, uh, an expression. So you've got something that involves these magnifications, which we're not really going to worry about. And you've got these phases here. And this phase, this phi jk, uh, is, I've used that as a shorthand to say this is the, the jth phase that I measure at my receiver 1 and, uh, and the k phase that I measure at, uh, at receiver 2. And I can write down what that is using that expression that I got from the, the phase. It's just that sum of the geometric phase and the screen phase. And I can expand it out. I can do a Taylor expansion. And if I Fourier transform this, that, that's what gives me these, these 
uh, points in the secondary spectrum. So if I Fourier transform this thing here, I get these delta contributions in uh, both delay and in and in uh, fringe rate, just as Barney and, uh, and Jim and Dan have been talking about this morning. And, but I have this uh, phase term here as well. And it's interesting to pick on that phase term and ask what it is for an interferometer. Well, it looks like this. And let me show you how you get this. I'm, I'm, I don't apologize for, for showing you the nuts and bolts, seeing this is such a technical workshop. So I, it's, I thought it's good to actually uh, put this down. And by the considerable, I have a considerable amount of time for contemplation on a flight between Perth and Toronto. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, well, I'd better write this down in longhand just for once because uh, I keep coming back to this. Uh, so, so let me do that. So I have an interferometer whose, uh, whose central position is capital R, and then the, the two elements are offset each from each other by some baseline uh, delta R. So I can, I can put this at minus delta R and 2, and this offset by plus delta R and 2. And then I can just expand out what these phase terms are, or the, at least the geometric phase terms ones that I'm interested in here. So you might remember this just came straight out of the fresnel kirchhoff interval. So I've got these positions x of my uh, station on my station on my uh, phase screen and here's the interferometer position here. And I just expand this out and I get a whole bunch of interesting terms. And I'll go th through these well hopefully uh, in a way that's uh, intelligible. This is just um, this is just the uh, the geometric delay between those those two stationary phase points. So this is like a theta i, I squared minus a theta j squared. There's another term here which involves r dotted with theta i plus theta j. And actually, if I got the sign, no, I've got the sign wrong. Serves me right for doing this in the plane and over the middle of the Pacific. That's a minus sign, sorry. This, however, is a plus sign. This is the, the baseline dotted with theta i plus theta j. And then I've got another term which is uh, probably unimportant, too small to be important. Mm. Um, so this is still in the stationary point. That's right. That is the assumption. Yes. Yeah, that means it's not, it has to be not really resolving it because it's not resolving it. The, the That's right. Yes. The point, for example, um, just would not That's a questionable right. assumption. Yes. Right. So if I go back here, then this is what that that phase difference looks like as seen by the two interferometers. So I have got a difference in the screen phase. I've got this the standard xi minus xi squared minus xj j squared. And I've got this other thing which depends upon the, the central position of the interferometer. But the point about all of these terms is that they're anti-symmetric when I exchange i and j. This term, however, here is symmetric when I exchange i and j. And that's the crucial point. This is the interferometric phase, the, the astrometric phase of those two speckles. So if you like, what I'm getting in this symmetric phase term is the average astrometric phase due to two speckles that are interfering on the phase screen. And the fact that everything else is anti-symmetric, and this one term here is symmetric, means that I can isolate it. So, what it means is that, well, we go back to the physical picture here for a second. As Barney and, and Dan and, and Jim have pointed out, I have a delay that looks like this. There's this other term here, by the way, that's related to, uh, so the delay usually involves just theta i minus, theta i squared minus theta j squared. There's another term that's neglected usually, and that's usually unimportant. Um, but I just thought I'd, I'd show it just to, 
illustrate the point. But there is in principle another term that can enter into the array, but it's usually negligible in this regime of strong scattering for something like Kolmogorov turbulence. I think there are basket cases where this term might actually be important, um, but maybe we can discuss that later on. Uh, and then there's the Doppler shift. And the point about that is that what you're doing effectively when you're looking with an interferometer is that this secondary spectrum allows you to isolate the interfering wave field of every pair of speckles. That's the beauty of the secondary spectrum. When you go from the dynamic spectrum to the secondary spectrum, you have isolated the interfering wave field of a unique pair of speckles. And then with your interferometer, you can then, having isolated that particular interfering uh, pair, then get its astrometric phase. Yes, I mean a speckle. I mean a stationary phase point. Yes. Let me skip this point for a second and go. Where did I want to go? Actually, what I want to do is go right over here to show this diagram that Barney showed before. So this is the plot for 0834 using this uh, this uh, uh, in the Brisk and Nadal data, and you can see the amplitude here and what's called phase. This phase is actually extracted using this anti-symmetric term. It's not actually the phase that I would get if I just got the complex visibilities and did a Fourier transform. It is this anti-symmetric phase. There is other information in the secondary spectrum which has not been plotted. All those other terms have been removed. Right? No, what I'm saying is that there are, is th I could just take the complex visibilities, I further transform them, right? But the, uh, the what the phase that the phase that's being plotted here is that is that astrometric term. Yeah. So. All these other terms here. Well, I, th th that, well, that's an interesting question, actually. Uh, and, 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 and to my mind, this. Sorry. Yes, I think so. It's because all of these terms are wrapping very fast, and the question is, can you usefully extract anything about this out of the data? And I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's something we should discuss. So the anti terms are wrapped very quickly, but the symmetric one you're saying is not. It's not. Well, as long as you've chosen your interferometer space correctly. Hmm. Yes, that's right. You, it, that's exactly it. You're using it, you're cancelling out those terms to isolate this thing. You know as well as I do. Yeah. So, so that's the key point. So that, in a nutshell, is is what's happening. That you you exploit you exploit the different symmetry of these uh, of these things. So. In principle, because the visibility is complex valued, as you point out, Waylee, you break this symmetry. You, you, you break the symmetry between the positive and the negative uh, tau, tau axes. And, and, and the question is, what, what breaks? Well, you have those two different types of terms. And then the anti-symmetric terms to that interferometric phase. So if you add up the, the phases from the negative tau and the plus tau terms, 
then you get uh, this particular term here. And that's just the average of those two things. What makes life particularly simple, of course, is that uh, for, for most of these scattering, scattering geometries, you have a relatively bright core. So you can, so you, if you're doing this, if you take the, the apex of one of these arclets, then, and you measure that, um, that astrometric phase of the apex of one of those arclets, you're measuring, you're effectively looking at the interference of the wave field with that uh, central image, which has an offset of zero or close to zero. So that enables you to, to actually uh, figure out um, what those individual positions of the theta i's are. Of course, just to, uh, I'll just show you the, the actual experiment um, on 0834 involved uh, uh, four well-known telescopes, the Stradral Bank, Westerbork, um, Green Bank and Arecibo. Um, there you can see. And, um, and one of the interesting features there that, uh, that came out of it is that we ended up using something like 200 hertz spectral resolution over the 32 megahertz, which was uh, quite, uh, quite good at the time. Um, and, and we did need that because, surprisingly, we saw all sorts of structure out to very high delays, including this, this, this thing that really quite blew our minds, this one millisecond delay feature. In, uh, in 0834, and I remember up until, until this point, Dan had been plotting these things with uh, the data was going up to well, there we go, up to about 300 microseconds, and it looked like it was it was it was tailing off. Oh, you'd be crazy to think there was any power further out. But lo and behold, that was in some sense the tip of the iceberg, or at least it was on the day we observed, and uh, and there were these uh, features going up to a millisecond. In fact. Walter played around with the data a little bit and, uh, and was able to find features that were way higher than beta, but way higher than a millisecond. So he saw features nearly up to delays of about eight milliseconds. And those, those features, I might add, were the things that, uh, that really did change their position and brightness in between individual eight megahertz IS. So these observations, there were uh, four eight megahertz IFs, and they're analysed uh, separately. So there are some basic conclusions that you could you could draw from the data, and many of the people in this room know them better than I do, so I'm not going to harp on them. I'll just show you a couple of pretty pictures, though. This is uh, so most of us uh, we've been seeing uh, intensity. Uh, dynamic spectra up until this point. This is a visibility dynamic spectrum where the colour encodes the phase. More to show a pretty picture. We've already, Barney's already shown this. Um, perhaps what hasn't been shown, this is a slightly different representation of the image that was shown in the paper, but this is, um, these are the, the positions of these individual speckles where I've just drawn a very light sort of um, blue uh, cloud as the error region of those individual speckles, and it somewhat highlights the, uh, the distribution of, uh, of those uh, speckles across the scattered image. So I won't harp on that again. There is a phase ambiguity. If you have a look at the, um, the original paper, you'll find that the, the image actually has two images of this one millisecond cloud, and that's because you suffer from some sort of uh, phase ambiguity, which you can resolve with uh, with multi wave uh, multi wavelength uh, synthesis, you need that to actually resolve uniquely the position of that one milli arc second uh, of that one millisecond uh, feature. So that was the uh, the final image that was uh, published in the paper, except with again with this ambiguous um, uh, position of this uh, of this uh, particular feature. And here the colour encodes the, uh, the signal to noise. So you can see the signal to noise is, is quite low on this. This represents, this blob here represents about 4% of the scattered power. So it's small but not insignificant. There's one last feature that I wanted to point out here that perhaps we hasn't been mentioned this morning by, um, by Barney or, or Dan. And, and, and that is that um, if you look very closely 
at the uh, at the secondary spectrum, you see there are actually three three generic features. So you've got this uh, this main parabola, you've got this one milli arc second uh, one millisecond blob, but there's actually this very straight line of power, very small, uh, that comes out of the origin here. And if you look at that carefully, it actually extends all the way back up here. It's like the it's like the um, one of those parabolas has been extended down. And you can understand how that arises uh, in this in this simple picture based on the uh, on the VLBI. So, of course, these things here, these green arc inverted arclets, represent interference things on this primary scattering disk with things with this bright uh, blob that's on the optical axis. And then you have this uh, this blue region here which is due to interference between this one millisecond feature and these and this bright core and other things on the uh, near the optical axis. But these this these purple features here represent the interference of individual blobs on this in this one millisecond uh, cloud with each other. And I don't know whether people have really uh, noticed that. It's quite a hard picture to see on the printed page in a paper. Um, but if you play around with the transfer function to have the data, you can actually see it quite clearly. And so I thought I'd uh, bring out that, that last point. And I think that is the last point I wanted to make. Um, no, it isn't. There's one last thing that I wanted to say, but it's already been said well by many others, uh, and and that is in this um, in this analysis, one of the things that really was quite striking, and, and Barney has remarked on it already this morning, Dan as well, that that the frequency scaling of these things is really quite perplexing. Well, maybe not to Wayland, um, but that that the if you model these positions of these speckles as some function of, uh, of wavelength, they seem to be essentially independent of, of the wavelength. There's a very small dependence on, on the wavelength, as if these are static structures that exist in the ISM, these, these groups of, of structures that are giving rise to these, um, to these uh, speckles or, or these bits of power that at least we can isolate in the, in the secondary spectrum. And, uh, and of course, uh, there are various models for these things, but I think it's one of the most striking features of, uh, of, this, uh, of this analysis, that these, uh, that these things seem to be actual structures in the ISM, um, things that are static and, and that house, perhaps in, in, the, in the stationary phase model, they're things that house points of stationary phase. Um, because obviously even with VLBI we don't have the resolution anywhere near the resolution to actually get down to the diffractive scale. So, uh, so from that point of view until we get to those sorts of resolutions if we ever do that would remain ambiguous but for, uh, for models for, uh, for what they might be. So I think I'll end there. Yes, it's assuming. Well, it's it is. A, it's actually a, an. It's not an image. It's a map of the distribution of the things that we isolated in the secondary spectrum. How you interpret that as an image is an entirely different matter. Um, well, we're assuming that the uh, that the wave front that is is uh, is um is spatially coherent yeah but yeah yeah now you you could ask the question and 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 and, and of course we've had various goes and you've had goes with Ryan analyzing this and uh, 
so it, it doesn't seem to be that it's resolved on this baseline between here and here. But the pulsar emission region. Yeah, that's right. But in principle, it could be. In principle, it is. I don't, unfortunately. Um, I think we estimated 4%. 4%, yeah, because I think the concern for Sanford was that effect the decision of Fulford. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, I think it's no, no, <laughs> because mm. it's only 4% in the radii in the millisecond, two millisecond Fulford. Probably doesn't overlap the median pulse. So it's not, it doesn't affect the Sanford score. So that's more like a hope, not necessarily. Well, you know, yeah. Yeah. So we are all right now. Um, also, with regard to this uh, magenta feature, this sort of spear like feature near the origin, um, I did want to note that um, uh, we have seen this same kind of feature, I would, I would guess now, four, five, or six data sets that, that, that we've seen this and wondered is that real? Is that real? Mm. So did you actually see the, a high delay feature? No. Spectral resolution uh, uh, problem. Spectral resolution, yeah. Mm. Is, this a, is this a data plot or a model plot? This is just a model plot, but I could I could dig up yeah. the FITS files and show you. Yeah. But, uh, because I hear I was just trying to anal I, I was just trying to explain. I wonder if I can go back. But also just to follow on your comment about my comment. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's a very faint from there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So even, even if you don't have the spectral resolution to see the high delay feature, you still should be able to see that uh, yeah. sphere. Yeah. 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 I mean, because it's it's low fluctuation frequency in your uh, yeah. uh, in your data, although it's very well confined. In, uh, it, it's just those. Uh, it's just those points interfering with each yeah. other on that off, way off axis feature. I, I think it's sorry. It's the phase projecting itself into the background. The central off axis is a different color in that plot. I don't know whether you can see it that That's easily here. Yeah, I, just, I, I think it's too light. Yeah. Yeah. 